So welcome all to our Friday conversation with Michael Latham, where we will be exploring film and society through Italian neorealism. Uh, I see a group of friends of the Graham School, so I am going to spare you the typical pitch about why Graham is so awesome because you already know it and believe it. And instead, I am going to jump right into an introduction of Michael. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree from McAllister College and his MA and PhD from the University of Chicago. He was awarded a Fulbright scholarship to study at the University of Bremen in Germany and received a prestigious Whiting Fellowship to support his dissertation research. He has taught many classes at the Graham School where he is beloved. Those include Film Noir, The New Hollywood, The French New Wave, and Pre-Code Hollywood. Uh, and I see many people that have been in his classes and have shared your enthusiasm and the thumbs up from Don uh, among them. Uh, and so you have been a beloved instructor here, Michael, and for some time you have taught courses exploring a number of topics through film and filmmaking. Uh, to set the table for our discussion and to preview what's coming up, I wonder if you could just give a three minute snapshot of your courses to date, uh, such as film noir, pre-code Hollywood, kind of what has motivated your courses so far, and then we'll jump into why you chose Italian neorealism for your upcoming course. Uh, thanks, Seth, and thank you all for joining us. Um, I <clears throat> Three minute sketch, I suppose, if I were to um, give an overarching kind of um, uh, conception that I follow in presenting these courses is to uh, take an, an, a somewhat expansive look at either um, something that is qualified as genre, something that is qualified as national cinema, um, and talk about how these um, cinemas, how these films are always in conversations with other cultures, um, are always in conversations with other uh, media, with other art forms. Um, and um, so as an example, the um, first course that I taught for Graham was a course on non-urban film noir. So where, whereas film noirs <clears throat> are generally considered an urban phenomenon, um, there are a number of really interesting noirs that are set in the countryside, that are set at the ocean side. Um, uh, and I, my sort of tenure at the Graham School did unfortunately overlap with the COVID epidemic. Um, so I had the pleasure of teaching the first course um, at the, uh, in a classroom uh, <laughs> with, where we could screen the films and then discuss them. Um, my second course on New Hollywood was a kind of touch and go experimentation in how to teach film via Zoom. When, as I learned in the course of the film, you can't really stream film <laughs> over Zoom. Um, you can see it, but the people on the other end of the transmission have a frozen image, have a loss of sound. Um, <clears throat> and I see uh, uh, Jim Gecker here among uh, uh, people participating. Um, Jim asked me if I thought I could possibly work with screenshots. Um, something that I instituted with the um, film noir course um, and uh, the most recent course that I taught on Precote Hollywood. Um, so that it's still possible to talk about <clears throat> mise-en-scene, still possible to talk about cinematography, um, looking at visual imagery from the films. You're a little short changed as far as being able to talk about um, editing and rhythm of editing and to talk about sound. Um, but it, uh, it seems to have been a, a fairly reasonable compromise. Um, and uh, yes, which brings us to uh, the, the forthcoming course on Italian. Yeah, so let's, I mean, jump in from a content perspective on this one. How did you come to Italian neorealism? And why did you see this period as so important not only for our understanding of film, which I, I know it is, but also for our understanding of post-war society. 
Um, well, I should mention that uh, I think I, I first saw um, Bicycle Thieves in a, a film course I took in high school. Um, and uh, for many people who see the film, it'll have a lasting impression on you. Um, I am a, a Germanist by training, although uh, my work has always been sort of interdisciplinary and, and, and across cultures. Um, and Italian neorealism, I mean, I've worked a lot with post-war German um, art and culture. Um, Italian is a, a kind of a personal um, interest of mine because my maternal grandparents emigrated from Sicily in the 1920s. Um, my mother grew up as a heritage speaker of Sicilian dialect. Um, I think I spoke Sicilian primarily until I was about five years old. Um, and um, so there's a personal investment here that to be truthful, I don't have uh, with the German studies that I've devoted much of my life and career to because I'm not German at all. <laughs> Well, and so um, as we kind of jump into this course, I'm wondering if you could, you know, kind of share a little bit about how film develops in this era. You know, what is the time period of Italian neorealism? What makes these films distinctive? And who are some of the people involved? And, you know, just to kind of put it another way, you've just shared a little bit about this debate about what is and isn't neorealism. And so why are some of the later films potentially not considered neorealist? Uh, okay, well, you touch upon a lot of things, Seth. Let's, let me start by saying that there is a, a, a very narrow and restrictive conception of what neorealism, what Italian neorealism is, um, which uh, taken in its purest form would probably limit um, uh, the the field to a total of maybe 15 or 20 films. Um, there is also a much more expansive view of what neorealism is, which is um, the perspective from which I'm working and the perspective that the course will explore, um, which is more about uh, continuity than about disruption, um, about the evolution of um, neorealism into uh, um, something beyond neorealism in, Itali in Italy that would um, be the sort of art films that uh, would follow the films of uh, Federico Fellini and uh, Michelangelo Antonioni, um, which are also on the uh, syllabus for this course. Um, the, 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 the narrow understanding, the narrow conception of neorealism um, begins with, uh, interestingly, the, the, what is considered the first neorealist film, um, uh, Lucino Visconti's Ossessione, Obsession from 1943, um, really kind of violates a number of the precepts of uh, what neorealism is considered. Um, and so it's, there's a debate about whether or not this film should be considered neorealist. Um, I'm less interested in those kinds of debates um, than in other lines of inquiry, but uh, the earliest neorealism films that really do kind of set um, an ethic, um, a, a focus of inquiry and, and uh, an aesthetic or lack of aesthetic really begin with uh, Roberto Rossellini's war trilogy, uh, the first film of which uh, Roma Cittaperta, Rome Open City, um, was released in 1945, um, was filmed four months, beginning four months after the Germans were driven out of Rome. Um, so it's recreating a very immediate past um, in uh, the transition from war torn Italy to post-war Italy. Um, and the aesthetic that it develops, the, the filmmaking process that comes to be associated with neorealism is really in a large part a product of the austerity um, and the material uh, deprivations of post-war Italy, not only in 
the focus and content of the film and the films that will follow, but also in the fact that one, uh, Chine Chita, the expansive, enormous film production facilities in Rome that were opened under the fascist government um, had been bombed by the Allied forces and after the war were being used as uh, refugee shelters for displaced persons. So there were no studios that the filmmakers could use. Uh, the retreating Germans had taken much of the filmmaking equipment, including cameras and editing uh, uh, equipment with them as they left. Um, there was not a lot of film stock available. And so the out of austerity grew as, as frequently happens, um, developed a kind of approach that would become an aesthetic. Um, there's always a danger of letting this aesthetic be kind of solidified into prescriptive um, measures, which does sort of happen and does sort of inform the debates around neorealism. Um, but Rossellini, um, shot with whatever film stock he had available. That was sometimes ends of rolls of film stock, sometimes rolls of film stock that um, uh, the Americans had for shooting newsreels. Um, they uh, shot entirely on location, again, because there were no studio facilities that they could use. Um, Rossellini did not use um, unprofessional actors in the way that uh, in Roma Cittapata, in the way that he would in his uh, second film in the trilogy, Paisan, um, and uh, the way that he would in uh, Germania Amuzero, Germany Year Zero, the, the final film in the trilogy, and the way De Sica would in his Rome trilogy. But he, the, the actors that he did cast um, in this film, um, uh, uh, Anna Magnani, of course, um, uh, who plays uh, the role of Pina in the film, um, and um, get my my notes here. Uh, were, were cast against uh, the roles that they were known for. Um, she was a, mainly known as a comic actress, um, and here she's cast um, in, uh, in this sort of devastating uh, uh, post-war film. Um, also, uh, uh, Aldo Fabrizi, who plays uh, Don Pietro Pellegrini, the, uh, the, the priest in the film, uh, who had made a number of comedies with Anna Magnani in the fascist era. Um, actually, before I get too carried away <laughs> here, I should point out that whereas Italian neorealism is frequently regarded as this upheaval and this rupture in the history of Italian cinema, um, a number of its principal uh, writers and filmmakers either began their career in the fascist era, um, or were in film school at the National Film School, the Centro uh, Sperimentale di Cinematografia in Rome, also opened under the fascists, uh, or were writing criticism um, for uh, publications of the era, um, one of which was um, called Cinema, which was the official publication of the film school. Uh, another was called uh, uh, Bianco e Nero, Black and White. Um, and uh, that, so there, 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 that's an interesting kind of overlap with the French New Wave that would follow where a number of the filmmakers came out of uh, criticism having written for uh, Cahiers du Cinema. Um, the first important uh, manifesto if you will, for a new Italian cinema, um, was published in 1941, in October 1941, um, by uh, Mario Alicata and uh, Giuseppe De Santis, um, called Truth and Poetry, uh, Verga and Italian Cinema, uh, calling for this kind of uh, focus on the lives of everyday 
Italian workers, peasants, um, and uh, using Giovanni Verga, the uh, one of the um, uh, realist naturalist uh, late 19th century Italian writers associated with a movement called Verismo, um, the Italian uh, version of European naturalism that was popular at the time. And then interestingly, both Alicata and De Santis would work on the screenplay for Ossessione, um, the first neorealist film, and their um, exhortation that films follow the example of Giovanni Verga uh, would come to fruition with uh, Visconti's other um, central neorealist film, uh, La Terra Trema, which is a kind of contemporary adaptation of uh, Giovanni Verga's novel, uh, I Malavolia, about uh, Sicilian fishermen. Um, to use that as an example of, 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 of a purer form of Italian neorealism, um, the, the only cast credit for the film is Pescatori Siciliani, Sicilian fishermen. And that's right. Well, those were the actors featured in the film. Uh, there was not a single professional actor on the set. Uh, another feature of Italian neorealism is that um, characters would speak the dialect of the regions where the films were being made, uh, as they do in La Terra Trema. And, uh, but even that film kind of violates a number of the precepts of neorealism because because not even uh, speakers of standard Italian could understand the dialect. Um, there is a voiceover narration uh, spoken by Visconti that he was asked to add to the film to make it comprehensible. Well, so that gives us a really great glimpse into what's happening in film and the filmmakers during this time period. And I wanna start inviting your questions because we definitely wanna cover different films that may interest you. But I wanna move us into another dimension of the course, Michael, because I know in talking with you that you're also looking at how major changes, obviously, as we are in the fascist period and then come out of it, are taking place in the politics of Italy, in the economy of Italy during this time period. And you look at how that influences Italian culture in general and how it influences Italian film in particular. And I'm wondering if you could just give us a little bit of that kind of contextual backdrop on Italy in this moment, how that's shaping culture, and then how that's then shaping film, which I know it's in a cycle because film is then reinforcing and, and disrupting norms. But maybe just take a step back and look at that political economy for a moment and, and how it shapes culture and film. Well, the, the earliest neorealist films are all about the, the, the materialist crisis in post-war Italy. Um, the widespread universal unemployment, um, uh, cities in ruins from both Allied and, and, uh, and German bombardments, um, uh, scarcity of food and other resources. Um, but as uh, the post-war period advances, the immediate material crisis relaxes. Um, one of the most interesting things about a number of these films for me, because they're all shot on location, many of them in urban environments, you can actually see uh, Italian cities being rebuilt in the course of the films. Um, wow. In uh, the new uh, uh, communal housing that's being developed, what, what was considered neorealist housing, um, in films like uh, La Trie di Biciclette, uh, Bicycle Thieves, in, uh, in, in as films as late as Fellini's uh, Knights of Cabiria. Um, and uh, so that, that focus on the material crisis uh, that informs uh, not only Rossellini's war trilogy, but very specifically um, the two, uh, the three uh, Roman films that uh, Vittorio De Sica uh, made, uh, Shusha, uh, Shushine, 
uh, Shusha, the name, that's not an Italian word, it's simply Neapolitans trying to say shoeshine, um, uh, bicycle thieves, and, and then uh, uh, Umberto Di, uh, Umberto Di, I, I, I have to confess, I, I didn't even look at the um, Wikipedia entry on Ital Italian neorealism until this morning, when they like said that Umberto Di is a comedy, it's like the most devastating film ever made. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, um, and, 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 and those films were, you know, were shot using non-professional actors entirely on location without scripted, um, without finished scripts with notes for a script, uh, inviting improvisation from the characters. Um, uh, Lamberto Maggiori, Maggiora, Maggiorani, who plays uh, Antonio um, in Bicycle Thieves, was a, a factory worker who was recruited to play Antonio in the film. Um, his wife is, is played by a woman who was a journalist who showed up on set to uh, interview De Sica, and he cast her in the role of Antonio's wife. Um, and then um, uh, the other uh, principal, Enzo Staola, uh, who plays the young boy Bruno, was just an onlooker, um, kind of curious onlooker watching them set up to shoot this film on the streets of Rome and was sort of discovered by De Sica as perfect for the role and recruited into the film. Okay, so from there, as, as both the economy recovers, first of all, um, and it recovers very slowly. The economic miracle in Italy uh, begins about a decade after the economic miracle in Germany is understood to, to develop in more like the late 1950s and late 1940s. Um, uh, there is at one point almost uh, into moving into the 1950s, there's almost universal employment. Um, uh, there's uh, modernization, uh, rebuilding, uh, wider industrialization. And then, as is the case with uh, post-war developments um, in Europe and in the United States as well, um, there is uh, increased urbanization. Um, people move from the country to the city for, uh, for jobs, to work in factories. Um, fewer people are working on um, farms, fewer people are, uh, and in a lot of these films, uh, the ways of escaping sort of your small town, your rural environment, your, your seaside environment is either to move to the city, as some characters do, um, or to emigrate, um, usually, of course, to the United States. Um, but as things recover, and then uh, and politically, the um, Right after the war, it was the uh, Communist Party and the Socialist Party of Italy who had been regarded as the heroes who liberated Italy from fascist rule um, and had and literally executed Mussolini uh, in 1945. Um, and they enjoyed vast popularity um, and, and majorities in parliament until 1948, when another important global development, um, the Cold War and how the Soviet Union went from being understood as, you know, for example, from our perspective, our, our allies in the Second World War to our ideological um, and geopolitical enemies. Um, that changed politics in Italy also, and beginning in 1948, it was the Christian Democrats who took over a majority in the parliament and they would remain the majority in Italy well into the 1990s. Um, and so, and then moving from the materialist to let's call it a more subjective kind of filmmaking, um, reflecting a more inward looking uh, Italian culture, if you will. Um, then really interesting things in my opinion begin to happen in Italian neorealism. Um, and we're getting kind of different perspectives from the principal filmmakers here. Um, 
there's so much to talk about, it's hard to even you know, sketch any of this out. But because of the documentary elements that are a big part of early Italian neorealism, you're dealing one with the, the, the familiar dilemma of the anthropological or ethnographic observer um, who affects the behavior of the reality that he's trying to capture. Uh, and, then, and then politically and personally among the, the, the three principal filmmakers, Roberto Rossellini, uh, whose father uh, was a very wealthy uh, builder who built a cinema in Rome called uh, Cine Cosmo, to which young Rossellini had like free reign to see as many movies as he wanted. Uh, Vittorio De Sica was a movie star and matinee idol um, of the, of the uh, fascist film period. So uh, for me, the cognitive dissonance of reading these histories of Italian neorealism where they're saying, De Sequa was responding to the white telephone films that uh, these bourgeois comedies like, uh, and then it names a bunch of films that he starred in. Um, and, and, then, and then even more removed from the reality of workers' lives is Lucchino Visconti, who is a count from a, a, a very ancient aristocratic family who grew up in not one palatial residence, but three. Um, and uh, Visconti, of course, was the most committed communist of these three. Um, Rossellini is more of a kind of left liberal secular humanist who is not is Catholic adjacent. Um, and there's no way around like the 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 shadow of Catholicism and the and 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 the Vatican and, and the Catholic Church in any of these films, um, particularly in the case of Rossellini. So the move towards a more subjective to a more personal um, uh, form of filmmaking. Uh, prof we see professional actors come back into the mix. Um, we see a, a, a mixture, a combination of location filming that is still devoted to neorealist principles with studio film, with uh, scene shot in studios. Um, but uh, even here, there's still a kind of a devotion to the principle of having as loose a screenplay, loose a script as possible. Um, but as these films become more subjective, um, in the case of Rossellini in particular, they also are, become much more about spirituality. Um, his other great trilogy, which is uh, a big part of the syllabus for this course, um, the so-called uh, Trilogy of Solitude, uh, the mm -hmm. films of uh, Stromboli um, from 1951, uh, Europa 51 from the following year, um, and then uh, Journey to Italy, uh, Viaggio in Italia from 1954, um, all films made incidentally with Ingrid Bergman um, after the two of them had begun their scandalous uh, affair that uh, kind of got you know, Ingrid Bergman uh, banned from Hollywood for uh, a number of years. Um, so that's that's in the- yeah, That gives us a sense. I wanna make sure we get to some of the questions that have come into the chat, but then we'll okay. come back and see if we can get further on this world of mm -hmm. how does it kind of reflect and connect to uh, workers' lives. Uh, but starting with uh, Dennis Callanan, are Open City and the Bicycle Thief and I know you've mentioned The Bicycle Thief a few times from your high school days, uh, mm -hmm. still considered two of the major films of Italian neorealism. So Absolutely. how do you place them in that? Absolutely. Although they both violate the precepts of Italian neorealism, which is why sort of these debates, is this really neorealist or is this not? Uh, I mentioned that the first neorealist film, uh, Ossessione, used professional actors, it's an adaptation of James M. Cain's The Postman Always Rings Twice. It's not an unscripted film. It's, a, uh, it's, a, it's basically a film noir uh, shot in, uh, in, in, in Ferrara in Emilia Romagna. Um, 
Rome Open City, as I mentioned, did use established and professional actors in its two major roles, um, although casting them against type. Um, but, and, and there are interiors that are shot in the kind of makeshift studio that they constructed for it. <clears throat> but otherwise, I think that uh, Ro Open City, Rome Open City kind of not only follows the precepts of uh, Italian real neorealism most closely, but basically defined them, being really the first of the neorealist films. Um, in the question of Bicycle Thief, uh, there are all kinds of problems with it that, um, uh, that, that, that take it away from the, a, a strict understanding of the film as a neorealist film. And I'll mention a couple of them. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so Tosica wanted to show um, a Rome that his uh, poor and, and working class characters would know and not show any of the like tourist attractions, any of the, the Colosseum, uh, any of the, the, the historical features of Rome. But he also used um, what the uh, Soviet uh, filmmakers called creative geography. Um, and we've all seen examples of this in films shot in Chicago when someone walks out of, you know, a downtown building and they're in Lincoln Park. Um, so the, the, the Mission Church where uh, Antonio and Bruno uh, pursue uh, the old tramp who, who's been seen with the bicycle thief, they cut from that to a bridge that's actually, you know, several miles away from the church. Uh, there is a rainstorm um, when they're looking for the stolen bicycle at the Porta Portese in Rome that was fabricated with the help of the Rome Fire Department. Um, and then possibly worst of all, uh, Alberto Maggiorani had a very heavy Roman accent. And in many of the extended scenes, De Sica uh, uh, dubbed the voice of a professional actor over <clears throat> Maggiorani's voice. Um, this was easy to do because basically all of the uh, neorealist films were uh, what is called post-synchronized. The sound was not recorded live with the image. It was added afterwards as a kind of post-production. Um, this largely because um, it made for much more lightweight equipment, lightweight cameras, that could shoot in locations that could kind of shoot on the fly, but also made it a kind of, and even the use of um, a post-synchronized sound, you know, makes you question the, 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 the like the, the great Italian screenwriter associated with neorealism and particularly with De Sica, uh, uh, Cesare Zavattini, um, who wrote the script for uh, Umberto Di and who collaborated on the script for Bicycle Thieves, had this idea of a basically unmediated relationship between reality and the camera as an ideal. I think, I think the way that he put it was, my ideal film is 90 minutes in the life of a man to whom nothing happens. Um, but uh, film is always mediated. I mean, the, the cinematic apparatus does not simply record reality um, the way that critics like uh, Sigrid Krakauer or uh, Andre Bazin, the founder of uh, Cahiers de Cinema, wanted to believe that it could, but there's always some element of mediation. So while those films would be considered two of the major films of neorealism, they also bring up some of the problematics of trying to define what neorealism is. Well, so um, we have some questions from Don Phillips. I'm gonna switch the order because I wanna talk okay. about the power of Italian neorealism to influence other genres and then come back <coughs> to the experience of learning more about the subject for your class. So uh, Don asks, where do you see the influences of Italian neorealistic films in today's cinema? And I know that you know you see parallels uh, into other courses you've even taught uh, in Hollywood, for example. But I'll let you share more. 
Uh, well, uh, Don and, and everyone, the uh, neorealism has a, a history of influence as well. Um, and, uh, and this uh, also addresses uh, James Gecker's question <clears throat> about its influence on Italian neorealism. Um, as you saw in that course, uh, they learn their craft from, you know, uh, Italian neorealists of, of using lightweight equipment, of um, uh, shooting entirely on location using only available light. Um, they, of course, did something beyond Italian neorealism, though, where uh, the principal cinematic aesthetic is slow, long takes, um, never like being showy with the cinematography or with the camera. Um, uh, Orson Welles said of um, Shusha, of Shushine, um, that uh, in that film, De Sica managed to do what I always wanted to do, but was never able to do. He made the camera disappear. Um, so addressing the history of its influence, um, it's, it's, it's influence on the French New Wave, of course, in the United States, um, immediately in its wake on uh, film noir, particularly uh, films noir that had a kind of uh, a more documentary element to them, like uh, Jules Dassault's Naked City, say. Um, it influenced uh, um, everything from Satyajit Ray's Apu trilogy in India to um, uh, the Cinema Nova in Brazil to um, um, uh, Gilles Pantacorvo's Battle of Algiers, the unthinkable without uh, the example of Italian neorealism. And then coming around to um, more recent films, um, also I can't leave out um, Haskell Wexler's great 1969 film, Medium Cool, shot in Chicago against the background of the uh, police riot and the Democratic Convention in 1968, <clears throat> where, you know, he just took his camera onto the streets and put, introduced his characters um, into that environment. But as far as more recent films go, Don, um, uh, I would name like a failed effort uh, being Michael Winterbottom's Welcome to Sarajevo, if you ever saw that film, uh, during the war, uh, where they just kind of brought their film troop in and started shooting on the streets. And then much more recently, um, Sean Baker's The Florida Project from 2017, and, and certainly Chloe Zhao's Nomadland, um, which you know, basically uh, almost everyone in the film is you know, not a professional actor. Uh, the film is shot entirely on location. Um, so yeah, it, I think that it's, uh, its legacy continues and is still informing filmmaking, but bear in mind that we are in the era of the uh, computer generated um, uh, blockbuster films with superhero uh, protagonists that could not be further away from neorealist principles. Um, did that answer your question? You're getting a thumbs up and a nod. So I'm okay. Uh, I want to close with this question from Don, Michael, because you've given us a great appetizer of why neorealism matters, how it influences society at the time, how it even influences what we're seeing in cinema today. Uh, it's a big topic to explore because you're looking at films, but you're also looking at context and you're looking at a really momentous time in Italian history, right? Coming out of this period of fascism, coming into this new era of politics and the economy. Uh, how did you organize the syllabus and choose the films for the course Don asks? And what are some of the highlights that uh, he and other <laughs> students here can look forward to viewing? And uh, having that question is a perfect prompt for me to just put in the chat uh, the registration for your course as you're <laughs> describing what this learning journey would look like. Um, as is often the case with any of these courses, there's always too much information and too many films to consider. So um, I'm, I'm actually going to ask uh, the class to watch a sessione on their own before the class even meets. Um, 
and then and then I've, I'm forcing myself to split up trilogies into no more than two films per class meeting. So the the film the class proper will begin with um, uh, the two films from Rossellini's War trilogy that uh, were filmed in Italy: Rome, Open City, uh, and Paisan. Paisan is episodic; it has uh, a number of uh, uh, different episodes shot in different locations uh, from Sicily, uh, following basically the Allied forces from the south to the north when they're liberating Italy from German <clears throat> German rule after the uh, armistice. And then um, the next week would be uh, Germany Year Zero, the third film in the trilogy, which was shot in Berlin, in the rubble of Berlin, and is actually considered one of the so-called rubble films uh, of post-war Germany. Um, and uh, paired with Shushine, which both of them have uh, young male uh, boys as their uh, central uh, protagonists. Um, and that is also considered the first film of De Sica's Rome trilogy. So the following course would follow that with uh, Bicycle Thieves and Umberto Di. Um, and then I want to, because uh, the attention to workers' lives was so central to the <coughs> neorealist moment, um, a section devoted to that, which would have uh, Giuseppe de Santis film, uh, Riso Amaro, Bitter Rice, about um, urban workers who go into the Po Valley to harvest rice um, and kind of bring the city to this urban area with them. And uh, Visconti's La Terra Trema, about the Sicilian fishermen, which I'd mentioned before. And then as things become more subjective, um, things uh, in the post-war um, uh, Italy kind of begins to heal and is looking to redefine itself in a way. Um, I go to Rossellini's so, uh, tr Trilogy of Solitude, but I think that the two of the three films that I'll focus on will be Stromboli uh, and uh, Journey to Italy, but also uh, Europa 51, I just don't want to do three films on that particular day. And then the transitional films, um, as far as continuities go, um, a lot of the generation that followed or the slightly younger filmmakers had started their careers working with uh, the three principles of neorealism. Uh, Fellini, for example, uh, worked on the scripts for both Rome Open City and Paisan. Um, and his early films are considered kind of taking neorealism and moving it into more, in his case, autobiographical, uh, more subjective dimensions. Um, and the two films I've chosen are Ivi from 1953, um, based on his cohort of young men uh, when he lived in Rimini, where he was born, and uh, La Strada from uh, the following year. Um, but uh, Knights of Kiberia could be, if it were streaming somewhere more accessible, would be there in place of the strata, I think. And then I want to talk about how uh, French and Italian cinemas were influencing each other. Um, both uh, Rossellini uh, worked with Jean Renoir in the 1930s on two films. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Vittorio De Sica worked with... Uh, uh, Renoir on two films in the 1930s. Um, Antonioni worked with Marcel, Marcel Canet, another of the poetic realists of uh, French film in the 1930s, who were very important to the Italian New Realists. Um, and as I, we talked about, the influence of uh, New Realism on the French New Wave is enormous, but in turn, the French New Wave films had an influence on the direction that neorealism would take. And I, I've chosen two films that are considered representative of the Italian new wave. Um, La Ragazza in Vitrina by Luciano Emmer, The Girl in the Window from 1961, and a wonderful film called uh, Il Posto, uh, The Job or The Place by Emanuel Olmi from the same year in which both of the principal uh, performers, the actor and actress in lead roles, uh, for the woman, it was the only film she ever made, but she did marry the director. And for the young man protagonist, it's one of three films that he made. 
completely non-professionals. And then in the final meeting for the class, I look at the legacy of it in, uh, in the, the, the um, development of neorealism into the art cinema that would follow uh, with uh, Antonioni's La Ventura from 1960 and uh, Pier Paolo Pasolini's Acatone from 1961. So the scope of the class really from 1946 to 1961 um, at its limit. Well, it is a fascinating class, even more so after hearing the line by line syllabus. Um, I'll just say for me, this takeaway of this momentous time in Italy, and then these individuals that are using film in a different way with non-professional actors, with this real focus on the human story, workers' lives, and then with the backdrop of changing cities, I mean, what an extraordinarily real way to look into one of the greatest moments of inflection in history. And so uh, you've certainly set the table for my interest and I see a lot of nodding uh, for others. Thank you, Michael, for helping to be a guide to this mm -hmm. genre of film at the Graham School and for, for all your teaching. My pleasure. Uh, always good to talk to you, Seth. Um, and always good to see uh, some familiar faces here too. Thanks I, so much for your support. Yeah, thank you. And I echo your enthusiasm for all of the friendly and familiar faces and hope everyone has a wonderful Friday and weekend. And remember you have one more week uh, to register for your autumn at Graham. So we look forward to a very bright academic year ahead. Have good days, everyone. Thank you.